the Trinity, one God in three persons, Father, Son, Spirit. It's sort of maybe the most uh, feared question among parents from their kids. How is one God three different people? Are there, you know, three gods? Uh, has anybody ever had your kids kind of ask or explore this question a little bit? Uh, yes, I know mine have uh, there, and uh, we have resources for you. We've got a great book on the Trinity in the nursery. Uh, shout out to our nursery there. Can you hear us uh, there? I think they can. There's a speaker in there. Um, so that kind of explains the, the concept of the Trinity for those who are very young. But people have uh, tried to come up with illustrations or easy ways to explain uh, the Trinity, and I got my, my props here. Uh, one of them is uh, this idea of water. Uh, have you, I don't know if you've heard this before, um, but people say, well, water is, you know, kind of always water, but it holds three different states, right? It can be liquid. I raided my kid's uh, kitchen here. It can be liquid. Uh, it can be s solid, right? You can freeze it uh, and ice, or, you know, you could put this kettle on the stove and it would be uh, gas in that way. And so, but they're all H2O, right? They're all the same thing. And that sounds good at first, uh, until we realize uh, that the same molecules of water can't be all of those forms at the same time. Uh, and I'm no chemist, uh, but essentially, meaning if we have 10 molecules of water, that same 10 molecules of water can't be liquid, solid, gas, all at the same time, right? They cannot coexist without being separate. And so therefore, I'm sorry to say the, the water analogy uh, has actually been uh, identified as uh, heresy by the early church, not this specific uh, water thing, but that idea of thinking, specifically what's called the heresy of modalism, that you know there are three different kind of modes uh, of God separate from one another that can exist on their own without or separate from the others. You know, so God does not morph from one form into another form the way water does. Okay, so that illustration doesn't work and breaks down. Uh, how about an egg? Uh, this has been proposed from time to time to try to explain the Trinity. You have the shell, you got the yolk, you got the kind of egg white, and they all exist at the same time, and they make up one egg. So three parts, one egg. Sounds promising at first, uh, until we realize that an egg can't be separated into different parts while still remaining and always being and representing the whole entire egg, right? The truth is, there is no helpful analogy or illustration, and it's okay to just be humble about it. They all break down and fall short, and they should, because we're talking about the greatest mystery there is. We're talking about God, for whom there is no equal, no equivalent, no comparison. God exists in another dimension. God is wholly other, unique, and so we can't necessarily think in terms of what we know. With that said, here's a kind of a fairly helpful picture that's a little more uh, accurate to what we're saying. Um, and so you have God, who is Father, who is Son, who is Holy Spirit, all at the same time, all making up the one God. But the Father is not the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit is not the Son. The Son is not the Father, right? They are distinct persons, but all make up one God. So for some of you, that might kind of be helpful. But as humans, we know the idea of one being, one person, right? I am a being in the person of Joseph. There is no other representation of me being outside of the person of Joseph, right? I can't show up as some other person and say, this is fully Joseph, nothing less. However, God is not like that. God is one being, three persons, 
at all times. Three persons, all fully representative of one being. And when you think of it that way, it's kind of not that strange. We're just not used to thinking of one being as three persons because there's no other equivalent or something to compare it to or example of it. But that doesn't mean, of course, it wouldn't be possible. God is who God is, and God as a being happens to be three persons, all of whom are fully God. Okay, so maybe you're already a little overwhelmed. Uh, That's all too philosophical uh, for you. And the truth is, theologians are pretty good at making pretty simple things complicated. And uh, my job as a uh, pastoral uh, theologian, if you will, is to make complicated things hopefully simple. So I'm not going to try to impress you today or in this series with fancy or kind of academic lingo. There are technical discussions of the Trinity and theological terms and debates about the Trinity, such as, you know, hypostases and perichoresis and equiprimal and like all this stuff. But we want the Trinity to be understandable to a child while remaining mysterious enough to still be a lifelong, joyful pursuit. So let me talk about the goals for this Trinity series and this introductory message. First and foremost, here is the number one goal, to experience God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit so that we may come into deeper union, meaning our hearts would be more like God's with the triune God. That is number one. And we're not trying to turn people into a bunch of academic theologians. We want to experience the three persons of God. Second is to better understand through the three persons of God who God is and what God does so that we might better reflect and accurately bear God's name through who we are and what we do both as individuals and, more importantly, as a community. In other words, it's kind of really just our vision statement of who we're always trying to be as a church, which is a Trinitarian statement that we long to be a family of fully devoted children of God. So children alludes to being children of the Father, who are fully mature in Jesus Christ, fully alive with the Holy Spirit, and then living, so bearing God's name, living as God intends, and loving as God loves. That's our goal for this series. So let me just walk you through what it's going to look like uh, in these five weeks. Today is a scriptural introduction. Next week, we're going to talk about God, the Holy Spirit. Then Hannah will walk us through God the Son. And then Paul will talk about God, the, the Father. And then uh, I will conclude and make some applications and uh, do a little more in depth about some uh, ideas of the Trinity on that last Sunday. But as you can see, the goal for this introductory message is to show that the Trinity, God in three persons, is really inescapably a biblical idea. So let's start with a very basic definition of the Trinity. And this is my own that I created because all the ones I found were just too complicated and technical uh, and confusing in some ways, uh, and it doesn't have to be that way. So here's just my definition of the Trinity. Maybe it doesn't stand up to uh, to, uh, theological uh, scrutiny, but the doctrine of the Trinity refers to the equal and eternal, those two keywords, those are two keywords, the equal and eternal existence of the three persons of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, And their communion together as the one God. Uh, Note that we say persons of the Trinity, not members of the Trinity, right? This is not a club. Um, You know, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit didn't have to pay to get into it. Uh, They don't walk around with their members-only jackets on. Uh, These are persons in the Trinity, So let's talk about the doctrine of the Trinity, and it's born out of really two mutually uh, informing things, which is scripture 
and then experience or revelation that comes along with that. And you could really put them in either order because experience of God in three persons influence the scriptures and the scriptures then influence the idea of God in three persons. But let's start with the main goal here, which is to understand the Trinity as revealed in scripture. So that if you want to take the Bible seriously and scripture seriously, you will be a Trinitarian Christian or believer. So let's start with the Old Testament. This is not just a New Testament idea. In the Old Testament, uh, we would kind of call these sort of allowances or allusions uh, to the Trinity in the Old Testament. And it starts at the creation with the first words of the Bible. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. So we have uh, the Godhead there, the Spirit of God mentioned. We do learn in the New Testament that Jesus was involved in creation, existed eternally. So Colossians 1, 15 through 17, the Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation, for in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through Jesus and for Jesus. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And the idea behind the the Greek language there is that if Jesus let go for a second, everything would fall apart. There are many other references or allusions to Trinitarian thinking in the Old Testament, such as uh, constant references to the Spirit of the Lord. There are, also, there are also potential what we call uh, Christophanies, just meaning appearances of Christ in the Old Testament. And so you can re- recall Paul's message not long ago on Gideon and the angel of the Lord showing up. And some say that that might have been an appearance of Jesus. Uh, we have uh, Melchizedek uh, as an appearance or at least a type of Christ in the New Testament confirms this. Uh, the three visitors of Genesis 18 are uh, often interpreted as an Old Testament appearance of God in three persons as the Trinity, and you can read that in Genesis 18. In John 12, 41, uh, John clearly interprets Isaiah's vision in Isaiah 6 as a vision of Jesus. Luke 24, 27, kind of Jesus just confirms all of this when he's walking on the road to Emmaus, if you know the story. And it says that beginning with Moses and all the prophets, that Jesus explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. Then the scriptures at that time would only refer to the Old Testament. And Jesus says, here's how you can find me in the Old Testament. And so all this corrects a sometimes uh, misconception sometimes that people have, and something that has led to heresy at times, which is that Jesus, you know, was was somehow created by God or didn't exist before coming to earth. Jesus has eternally and equally existed with the Father and the Spirit for all eternity. So although not fully developed, the seeds of understanding God as three persons uh, was already there in the Old Testament. Even if not fully intellectually, at least experientially, people were already experiencing God in three persons. But it's the New Testament where this understanding is really cemented and uh, it's really fully revealed by God. So let's look at the, the New Testament. And... The truth is, you can't really make sense of reading the New Testament without a Trinitarian reading or understanding, even if they hadn't fully developed the full doctrine of the Trinity. But the Trinity is a model that that really helps us understand and interpret the Bible better and understand what's going on. So let's start with some obvious passages or statements. Some of the last words of Jesus in Matthew 28 19, of course, are go and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And we'll be doing that next week. It was supposed to be this week, but the uh, candidate got COVID, so uh, we adjust and we'll have uh, another baptism next week. 2 Corinthians 13, 14, Paul says, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ 
and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Then there's uh, longer passages, so such as John 14, which Hannah read at the beginning, which certainly imply God as three persons. Jesus says, the only way to the Father is through me. And he says, if you know me, you know the Father. I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. And if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. That is, we are the same person. And then he says that when he leaves, he's not really leaving, because the Father will send the Spirit, who is also the person of God, and allows us to be in union with Christ. And there's just this incredible divine mutuality and interconnectedness between the three persons of God. And then we have some confessional and and almost uh, hymn-like passages that mention the three persons of the Godhead in the same breath, which kind of tell us that we are meant to worship God in this way. So Ephesians 3, 14 through 17, Paul says, For this reason I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with with power through his Spirit." in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. So these verses depict what is then called in verse 19, the fullness of God. And there are other passages in Ephesians listed there that kind of uh, give the same idea. That's Paul. How about Peter? First Peter, very beginning of the book, starts out, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to God's elect, who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through the sanctifying work of the Spirit, to be obedient to Jesus Christ, and sprinkled with his blood. So you can't get around this idea of God in three persons in the New Testament. So... Over the next 400 years, I'm going to kind of gloss over it, a lot happened (laughs) that sharpened this idea of the Trinity. And we don't have time to tell the stories or or even kind of many controversies as they worked this out. It's pretty fascinating in a way. Uh, It's also a little bit exhausting, uh, to be perfectly honest. But for those who want to explore uh, further, the two really defining moments are these church councils that take place, one in Nicaea in the year 325, And then there's kind of a a re-meeting to go back over what happened in Nicaea in 381 in Constantinople. And both of which affirm very uh, firmly the doctrine of the Trinity as essential Christian belief or orthodoxy. And so we get a lot of our kind of creeds out of uh, these two councils that took place. So here's kind of my scriptural conclusion is that the Trinity describes the co-equal, co-eternal communion between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And all this was and is based on experience. How people experienced God. And here's maybe one of the most important takeaways from this series for you, something to always keep in mind. The Trinity is not a doctrine to be debated, but a truth to be experienced. That is so important, right? You don't have to fully get it all. It's not about debating all the finer points. It is a truth to be experienced. And this is sort of our main uh, apology, just meaning defense, if you will, of the doctrine of the Trinity, That it's often our experience that leads to our theology, not our theology that creates our experience. And this is true in the Bible, we see it, and it's true throughout Christian history. All these scriptural passages were based on and written out of experience of the three persons of God. They were not necessarily committees or formal statements. Some of those came later, but they were just a way to confirm or affirm what people were already experiencing about God. And so in short, the doctrine of the Trinity was, and it simply is, simply a response to what believers 
have and had already experienced about God. So you want to know the Trinity? Do you want to be a Trinitarian expert? Then experience the Trinity, God in three persons. Cultivate a relationship with God the Father through the Son by the Holy Spirit. Enter into and participate into the mystery of the Trinity through prayer to the Father through the Son by the Spirit. That is the good news of the gospel, that you can come boldly and freely to God the Father who loves you as his child, and you come boldly through the Son, and you do it by the Spirit who enables and empowers that relationship. And in fact, that's what happened this morning. I mean, that was obviously completely unplanned. But what happened as a word was shared from the Lord? The heart of the Father was communicated. But how was it communicated? Through the grace of Christ. But how did it all come about? Well, the Spirit prompted someone's heart to speak a truth. That's how God in three persons works. The Trinity is to be experienced in that way. That's the good news of the gospel.